Good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible class, and we'll continue our study regarding God's providence, uh, prayer, and free will. This evening, I hope you're staying warm and indoors and uh, leave the faucets dripping a bit so they don't freeze. Uh, past couple of nights, we've had an issue with our uh, water heater and um, having to use a propane torch to heat it up. I wouldn't recommend that, but uh, just keep that in mind uh, and take care of yourselves during this, uh, this winter freeze that we're going through. I appreciate you tuning in and your, appreciate your interest in this subject, and I hope this evening that we uh, will cover some information that is very beneficial to you. In fact, I believe that it's going to be one of the tenets uh, that you'll find at the bedrock of Christianity uh, and the bedrock of your faith and uh, questions that you receive during, the, uh, during your walk uh, with uh, the community. Uh, you, you will uh, be able to handle those questions um, better with uh, being armed with uh, the information that you'll receive this evening. And so I appreciate your attendance. And, uh, and of course, you know, if you have to miss a class, don't let it be this one. So, so hold on to this class as we, um, as we move forward uh, with this subject. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our gracious God, we're so thankful for the blessings of life that you give to us. So thankful for your omnipotence and your and your willingness through that omnipotence to rescue man in his time of need and providing him providence that uh, through your mercy and through your tenderness and love that man can uh, be with you uh, in eternity. And we're so thankful for that. Help us to understand our, our study this evening. Help us to apply your will to our lives. Help us not to uh, allow things of this world and the perceptions of this world to, uh, to uh, move us away from a focus on you and uh, our faith in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so now we're going to begin our study. Uh, I hope that my PowerPoint or my uh, Prezi presentation works well. Um, as you can see, we are going to cover uh, some topics, and our, our, our topic this evening is, uh, is the implications of God's complete knowledge. What, what can we expect from uh, the implications regarding God's complete knowledge? And so let's look at a, a summary of the things uh, that we have covered. We've covered in the past uh, uh, couple of weeks, we've, we've covered the, the teaching that God has not revealed all things to us. And so we need to approach the scripture with humility. And uh, that is key uh, in how we uh, proceed with our Bible study. Humility, understanding that there are secret things of God that we must respect, uh, things that are only know, known to him and as such, uh, we need to leave those secret things to God. But that doesn't mean that we can't know things. Uh, for in fact, Jesus says, uh, any man who wills to know the will of the Father can know it, uh, found in uh, the book of John. And so we can know the things that are revealed by God to us. And in those revelations, we can use the divine uh, prescribed way of understanding and following his will. It's not some nebulous thing that, uh, that people have their own way of understanding and understanding is subjective. God's truth is objective and applies to everyone for every moment of time uh, to everyone who has ever lived. And so as a result of that, there is an objective truth and there is a divine way, as taught in scriptures, to understand that objective truth. Uh, and when we understand this, then we could come to the unity of the faith, uh, as Paul describes for the church in 1 Corinthians, uh, where he says that he marvels. He, he's, uh, he sees that these different groups are following uh, different uh, other people, but he says, was Christ divided? Uh, no. The idea there that Paul is presenting is they can be in unity, they can understand the truth as it is revealed, uh, and they can apply it to their lives uh, in harmonious uh, agreement uh, with the will of God, which brings about unity of the body of Christ. And so remember these things that that, yeah, there are secret things to God that only belong to him, but there are things that are, have been made known to us, 
and uh, that draw, that we can draw by divine reasoning, uh, the, the way to reason from Scripture, uh, we can draw implications that are just as pressing, just as true uh, as, as the divine um, statements found in Scripture. And so we'll go through some of this as we move along. So uh, hold on as, as we move through this. And again, don't, don't jump to... Uh, don't jump to conclusions uh, right off the bat. When you hear something, um, understand it, uh, apply it and its concept uh, just for what it is, uh, and and then let's see where that leads us, okay? So uh, sir, we must search out the things that God has revealed to us. And one of the things that he has revealed to us that is plainly taught in Scripture is his knowledge is complete. There, there is nothing that is unknown to God. Um, and that is uh, imperative for us to understand uh, that when God sees things, he sees them from beginning to end for all eternity. There is no beginning of knowledge for God because he already knows it. Uh, there is no end to the knowledge of God because his knowledge is not limited. Uh, so therefore, he knows the, the, the end even before the beginning. Uh, as uh, Isaiah had said in our, our passage from last week. And so it's a hard concept of grasp, but hold on to, to that understanding because it's going to drive implications uh, as we move forward. So remember, nothing is hidden from him, uh, not even by time or space. You see, God is not bound to know something just because it's on a timeline at when it happens. He knows it before it happens because he's outside of time and space, and he is the creator of that which uh, is uh, is moving um, through time. And so keep that in mind. He possesses the knowledge of things which he declares. When he declares something, it, the implication is he knows the matter before he even declares it. So uh, we studied those passage in the, passages in the Old Testament where he knew the names of individuals before, hundreds of years before they ever uh, took their first breath. And he knew uh, the choices that would be made um, throughout all time. And, and so he possesses knowledge of things which he has declared. Uh, and we'll study about that in, in connection with um, Ephesians uh, and how his providence his care then works in uh, with that which he knows. Um, anything he knows, he has always known. There is not a beginning or end to what he knows. Um, for instance, when you think about God knowing you, when you think about God knowing <clears throat> you, he knew you for all eternity. Just think about that for a moment. It, you were not just some random thought that popped into the mind of God and then my, God says, oh, well, I have to provide a plan for Kyle. No. As soon as he declared, as soon as soon, it, it, there is no beginning to that. So there is no as soon as statement to be made. You have been in the mind of God throughout all eternity. There was never a time in which God existed that you were not in his mind. Think about the power of that. Think about the implications of that. And think about the love that God has for you, knowing that you were eternally in the mind of God. And there was never a time in which God had not thought about you. It's amazing. It's an amazing thing to contemplate. The knowledge that he has is not acquired as if you were born and then God knew you existed. No. God knew you existed before you were even born. If his knowledge only came to him as it occurs within a time line sequence, 
then his knowledge would not be complete knowledge from beginning to end. It would just be a knowledge acquired step by step. And, and that's not the God that is described in Scripture. So think, think about those things as we study through and the implications when thinking about yourself and thinking about the care that God has for you and and all uh, and what he's provided in difficult times. You know, there are some times that come along that sickness and distress and all sorts of pressures, especially during this time when when we're isolated, things come to your mind and you think, well, does God care? Does God care? Absolutely, he does. As long as God has existed, man has been in his mind. And as long as man has been in God's mind, that tells us how long God has thought about you and thought about me and thought about our situation, even down to the counting of the hairs on our head. So let's go on and look at some misconceptions regarding um, regarding this knowledge and the implication of this knowledge. So let me let's stop right there and let me give you an example of of how God's mercy and God's love and His His uh, compassion and His providence is, is beyond our comprehension. If you would look at um, Look at John chapter 13, uh, John chapter 13 and beginning in verse 18. This is when Jesus is identifying his betrayer. He says, I do not speak concerning all of you. I, I know whom I have chosen, but that the scriptures may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. You see, God declared in scripture that the Messiah was going to be rejected, that he was going to be betrayed by one of his own. And he declared it because he knew it. Now I tell you before it comes, that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives me receives him who I who sent me. And when Jesus said these things, he was troubled in spirit, and he testified, saying, "Most assuredly I say to you, one of you will betray me." Then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke, and. There was one on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him and asked who it was whom he spoke. And, the, and leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said uh, to him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, it is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Think about that for just a moment. God in his eternal knowledge, having man in his eternal mind, knowing the depths of what was going to occur, the suffering that was going to occur, comes down to this very moment in which Jesus Understanding and foreseeing all things identifies Judas as his betrayer. And yet, at that point, Jesus submitted to the will of the Father. He didn't re uh, revile against God's plan. He did not uh, stand up and say, this is unfair. He accepted the will of God knowing, knowing the eternal plan that God would have for Mankind, And so, isn't it amazing how God's mercy and his love and his kindness provided that even when he could have bended, bended the rules of time, bended the rules of, of, uh, of what was to occur, occur, God allowed the, the events to play out um, 
as he continued his providential care. And so that is the way it is with us. You know, God has, God knows, and God is a God of providence. And he provides us what we need, no matter what comes our way. So keep, keep that in your mind. It's, um, it's, sometimes it's difficult uh, during these days to, to think about that, but hold, hold on to that. In an effort, as we go on to study about the knowledge of God, in an effort to avoid and refute um, one erroneous extreme, um, we tend to uh, sometimes adopt an opposite extreme uh, in order to prove that one point uh, erroneous. We, we adopt a, 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 an opposing extreme that violates other doctrines uh, taught in Scripture. And so let's not be guilty of that when it comes to um, God's foreknowledge, his providence, um, and the free will of man. Let's understand there are certain lanes in which uh, things travel and understand sometimes those lanes just don't cross um, and we just need to be careful uh, not to force a crossing into a lane when uh, when it's uh, not uh, an implication of scripture and not taught by by God's word so here we go with some mis misconceptions of this um, the same with the same clarity that God speaks regarding his foreknowledge, he speaks with the same uh, fortitude, with the same um, uh, direct truth that demands man to have free will. Um, if man did not have free will, then the Great Commission is just something ludicrous, and, and its, its execution is a waste of time because if man cannot choose and man is not free to choose, then there's no way for uh, the Great Commission to go into all the world and make disciples of all men could be carried out. Uh, to teach them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. If, if it is the case that man's uh, free will is impeded upon by God's foreknowledge, uh, then um, it's, it's an entirely waste and futile effort to even begin to read the scripture. And, and we know that's not the case. Some passages listed below in Matthew, 2 Corinthians, and Revelation chapter 22, it tells us uh, God has declared that this is what we must do, and we must choose, uh, make a choice between the two. So if God has declared a choice, then we know there is a choice to be made. Uh, and as such, um, the Bi that's what the Bible teaches, that man is a free moral agent, he is, uh, that is just as much of a truth as God's foreknowledge. Um, one does not limit the other in any way. And we'll go on to talk about how that, that occurs. In Matthew, he says, uh, Come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Well, if we have no free will, there's no way that we could come unto Jesus uh, when we're weary. Um, and to understand that passage, come unto me if we have no choice. Uh, he says, take my yoke upon you. Well, we, we couldn't choose to take his yoke upon you. It would be forced upon us uh, and learn, learn of him. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You can see that without free will, this, this passage would absolutely mean nothing. Another passage that Paul told the church at Corinth, uh, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, and uh, as though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. If man was not a free moral agency, then this passage would absolutely have no meaning, and nobody could understand it. Uh, it would just be a, a matter of uh, reactionary molecules uh, of, our, uh, of our physical existence that would um, either impede us or, or allow us to be reconciled to God without any consciousness of, of, uh, of knowledge that that is what's happening. And so it is just ludicrous to believe that uh, man, uh, that, that God's foreknowledge impedes upon the will of man. And of course, the one in Revelation by John, and the spirit and bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come, and let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who wishes to take uh, the free gift of the water of life. Well, 
If you have no free will, then there is no call to come and there is no response to that call. And the one who is thirsty can't recognize he's thirsty. And the one who wishes to take the free gift of the water of life could could not uh, do it. Uh, they would be uh, in in uh, have not have the ability to make make that choice. And so Henry Thiessen puts it this way: the knowledge of the future is not causative. Um, in other words, uh, just because you know the future does not mean that it causes the response to that. Uh, so the foreknowledge of God is not causative to the reactions um, that it knows. For instance, Henry Ford built the automobile. Henry Ford perceived and could have, with foreknowledge, know that there would be accidents uh, that would occur. Uh, the reasoning that Henry Ford then is responsible for every uh, causation of accident is uh, is not in keeping with logic. Um, if two trains, uh, if we are standing, uh, riding in a helicopter, and we look down and we see two trains running on the same track toward each other at 80 miles an hour, because we have the knowledge that that is what is occurring, uh, does that mean that we caused the accident? And of course, that was that would be about to happen when the trains collided. And of course, the answer is no. Um, we knowing something and causing it to happen are two different things. Uh, God having uh, eternal knowledge and having infinite knowledge does not require him to be the causation effect for what occurs uh, within uh, that knowledge. And, and that's what Henry is saying. Free actions do not take place because they are for, foreseen, but they are foreseen because they will take place. And so you see the difference there. One can know something will occur without being the causation uh, for that action. And, um, and that is uh, what uh, Calvinists and uh, others of the same mindset uh, will attempt uh, to press. But, but causation, uh, knowledge does not require the causation of the action. Um, you can know something is going to happen, uh, but you can also know that there will be other causations uh, that cause, cause that action. And so, um, according to Peter, the sacrifice of Christ was foreknown indeed before the foundation of the world, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20. And so does this uh, require that God, knowing that Christ would be needed, does it require God uh, to have been the causation for why it was needed? And the answer, of course, is no. That's why free will uh, stands on its own. Uh, God saw it. He provided uh, the care for it, but he did not. Re uh, he was not responsible or the causation uh, for it to occur. He knew it would happen, uh, but he would. Uh, he would then provide. His providence would provide. And so, does free will require God not to know what free will uh, choice is made beforehand? Okay, so here's. Here's the, uh, the flip side of that. Um, Calvinists will shorten the free will side and say, God, because God know it, knows it, then he must um, determine, uh, he must be the causation uh, for what is required. And that's not true. The flip side of it is, well, man's free will uh, overrides God's knowledge. Um, that in order for God uh, to allow free will to move forward, he had to limit his knowledge in such a way um, that would uh, allow for man's free will. And that's not, uh, that's not an implication uh, from Scripture either. Limiting God's knowledge is limiting God, period. Uh, it goes against what the Scripture teaches. Um, it, it, it is a limited God made by us 
uh, trying to fit God in a box for us. And it is not uh, the God of the Bible. Um, we have determined that someone knowing something does not demand that it was that it was that person that caused it to happen. We are now getting into that just because something will happen uh, does not require a limited knowledge uh, that the thing will occur. Um, and so we can see in Psalm 147 and verse 5, God is infinite in his knowledge. Uh, there is no way that God is going to limit him. Um, it was uh, T.W. Brents uh, that taught or believed that uh, God could limit his own knowledge and thereby uh, allow free will of man to um, to exist. And, and that's not an implication that's found in Scripture. Um, in fact, um, another uh, preacher who I, who I won't mention by name, but uh, back in the 50s, um, he, he taught something similar. And he asked the question, how could God foreknow the sin of Adam without prede predetermining that he would commit it? And of course, the assumption there is because God knew it, then he predetermined it to happen. Um, and it, the assumption is that God could not have known it without predetermining it to happen. Therefore, some would believe that God did not know whether Adam would or would not sin, but provided a means just in case he did. This limits God's infinite knowledge, and it also lists, limits his eternal plan that he would save man in Christ Jesus. It also limits the application to the church, uh, the church being in the eternal mind of God. Um, and it just, it just does not follow. Uh, this limits God's infinite knowledge and therefore is a wrong assumption um, that God did not know uh, that man would sin. Um, and so uh, God's foreknowledge of man's choice, choices, of course, in life has nothing to do with man's freedom to choose his own course. Uh, Roy H. Lanier makes this uh, fantastic point. And when God created man, he not only knew the possibility and the probability of man's sin, he also knew the certainty of it because he foresaw it, not because he caused it. And let, let's reiterate this fact. When God created man, that was in his mind eternally, that was, God knew that it was in his mind, that man was going to be cre created. He not only knew the possibility and the probability of my sin and your sin, but he also knew that it was going to be a certainty. Why? Because he foresaw it. Remember, he's outside of time, outside of space, uh, and, and therefore not bound by a chronological order of things. So he knew it. He knew it with, a cert uh, with certainty uh, because he foresaw it. And that does not require him to be the causational uh, fact for it. Um, nor did God choose to limit himself. It is, it is illogical to say that I will limit what I know for all eternity until I can know it later when it occurs. What does this require? Um, what does this require? If, 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 uh, if we say, well, God knew it, but he had put it out of his mind. It requires us to uh, conclude that as long as God could forget it, he could also remember it at the same time in order to forget it. And, and it just does not follow. Um, it, it's like me telling you, do not think of a pink elephant. Uh, don't think of a pink elephant. In order not to think of a pink elephant, what must you do? You got it. Think of a pink elephant. Um, and it just does not, it just does not work in, in that way. Um, and so it, uh, to, it, uh, to say that God chooses not to know is to require him to know uh, what it is so he cannot know it. And, and that just is not a logical position uh, to take. 
And so just to go over some, some different uh, things regarding uh, the use of accommodative language and figurative language in Scripture, um, you know that the Bible was written for man, not, not the Bible written for God. It was written for man's understanding and to be able to understand God in such a way that he could identify with him. And so God has given attributes um, regarding this. Uh, uh, he, he, he is seen walking in the garden with Adam. Um, he, is, uh, he has eyes um, for which to see. Um, he has hands uh, for which to do things. And, and these attributes found in Scripture are figurative language. And the Bible uses them all the time. Uh, the Eternal Sta uh, International Standard Bible Encyclopedia gives us this. A uh, scripture makes use of anthropomorphic, ugh, that's a tongue twister, anthropomorphic uh, forms of expression in regards to the way in which God obtains knowledge. Uh, for instance, in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8. And sometimes even representing him as if he did not know certain things. In Genesis chapter 11, 5 through uh, 18, 21. Nevertheless, the constant representation of the scripture is that God knows everything. He is omniscient in the strictest sense of the term. Um, meaning that uh, when, these, when these phrases are used... Uh, uh, God calling to remembrance, um, God seeming to change his mind. Um, those types of things are written in a way for man to understand uh, God from a human standpoint. Um, thus, the passages like in Genesis 18 and Genesis 22, where it seems to say that God uh, uh, bent history um, in order to fulfill his will. Um, that, that is a simplified uh, expression of God's mind and his foreknowledge in order to make the declaration necessary uh, to point man uh, to Christ, uh, to understand uh, at a certain level of man's education of coming to know God, uh, to understand his uh, providential care uh, throughout all time and in all time uh, in such a way that man could comprehend the care and the love. Although God already knew through his foreknowledge that that was going to be what occurred. How did he know it? Because he knows himself to be love, knows himself to be caring and compassionate, and knows himself to be concerned and uh, through his providence will provide what is necessary uh, throughout all eternity. And so these types of descriptive languages are, are examples of how God revealed himself, though um, though already knowing what was going going to occur. And we can uh, go into that a little bit later in a little bit more detail with another class. We're, we're running kind of tight on time. So we want to move forward. Um, in the case uh, that God made a plan of redemption for man before he made man is found in Romans chapter 8 and Ephesians chapter 1. And thus, the vicarious death of God's Son was in God's plan uh, for man, uh, and that was before he ever made man, says Rex Turner Sr. Um, in, in sy Systematic Theology. Uh, so uh, let's, uh, let's take a moment and just look at uh, the meaning of Paul's words in Ephesians when we talk about this. Look, look at Ephesians chapter 1. Um, and beginning in, in verse 1. Um, let me pull that up on, on uh, my screen here. Um, Ephesians 1 and verse 4. Um, it's relevant to what we are discussing uh, to understand uh, free will and God's foreknowledge and how they worked in 
the application of Paul's words uh, to the church at Ephesus. Paul states that God chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blemish before him in love. Notice how many times Paul says in Ephesians chapter one, in him, through the beloved, uh, all of those types of phrases are found throughout the chapter. Um, and, and it points to us uh, that through God's uh, eternal knowledge, he provided uh, the way uh, that those who would be saved would be in Christ Jesus. Uh, he doesn't predestine individuals. He predestines the place where individuals who seek him would be found. Uh, that is what Paul's citing here. Uh, the Calvinists cite this verse as proof that God arbitrarily and unconditionally uh, cho chose in eternity the very individuals who would be saved and that this number can neither be augmented or diminished. However, neither of these uh, nor any other passages see teach such a dark and dismal doctrine. Uh, rather, the demands of the passage are quite well satisfied underst by understanding Paul to declaring that God determined before time, this is in a reference to his foreknowledge, that those who would be, eter be those that would enter into Christ, that is, choose to enter Christ and live a holy and unblemished life, would alone be those whom he would save. Uh, those who are in Christ constitute his church, uh, verse 1 of the same chapter. They constitute, constitute that which is his body, uh, uh, verses 23, 22 and 23, um, and which he expects to be holy and without blemish, uh, chapter 5, verse uh, 27. While, while uh, Paul is utterly, utterly rejecting um, the Calvinist spin on this passage, um, we don't do any violence uh, to suggest that God's foreknowledge, he knew before the foundation of the world, the specific individuals who would be added to the church uh, so as to constitute the elect. And so Jesus did provide the place knowing, uh, knowing uh, through his uh, foreknowledge uh, who would be there and who would not. Um, but his providence provided the place. Without his providence for all time, no one would be saved. Um, so Paul also wrote to the Roman saints uh, of the same thing regarding God's knowledge. He says, for whom he foreknew, he also foreordained to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among his brethren, uh, whom he foreordained, uh, them he also called, and whom he called, he then justified, and whom he justified, he also glorified. That's Romans 8, 29 through 30. This passage declares that God possessed knowledge uh, of those whom he, number one, foreordained uh, to follow his son, number two, called, that is, he called them by the gospel, 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14. And three, he justified. Four, he glorified. That is, uh, eventual reward to those who have uh, been justified. And so Paul is speaking of the church in the eternal purpose of God, Ephesians chapter 3, 10 through 11. And it was in this eternal purpose that he foreknew and foreordained and called and justified and glorified the people that would make up his church. And since none are yet glorified, Romans chapter 8, verse 17, we are forced to accept this as a statement of purpose and not as things, uh, as things accomplished. Uh, so he is still continuing uh, that work to this day. And while whom he foreknew would certainly include the church in the aggregate, this phrase may more specifically refer to God's knowledge of individuals who met Paul's description. John writes of those whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, Revelation 17 and verse 8. If some names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, 
then the implication is that some names have been written uh, in the book from the foundation of the world. Um, not to write or to write the names of people requires knowledge of their identity. Uh, the Lord knoweth them that are his, 2 Timothy 2.19. And some might quibble over the uh, preposition from as opposed to before um, in that passage, but the whole idea is still the same. God knows them who are his. Uh, that doesn't require, again, that doesn't require him to overcome free will in order and be the causation as to uh, their salvation. Uh, God saw it, uh, and therefore uh, their, their free moral agency was intact, and they could choose. Uh, but he saw it nonetheless. Uh, others suggest that the world refers to the dense dispensation of time, but that doesn't fit the context either. And so I, I won't go into further greater discussion about that, but but you get the gist, the whole idea uh, back down to, uh, to earth, so to speak, um, is the idea that, uh, that God's foreknowledge does not require you to, uh, to, to uh, impede your choices. Um, he saw what was happening. He can identify. Cannot, does God's foreknowledge know who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost? Well, the answer is yes. His foreknowledge has that in mind. Does that mean that God, uh, God uh, chooses uh, for individuals? No. Why? Because free will can work in, harmo uh, in har a harmonious way that allows God's knowledge uh, to exist in all of its fullness uh, as well as allowing free free uh, choice uh, for mankind. And, and so that's, um, it's a hard concept. Um, those who, who follow Calvinists would shorten uh, the side of free will. And those who are non-Calvinist um, may, may uh, want to shorten uh, God's foreknowledge in order for, to force a, uh, a, a crossroads between the two and not recognize that foreknowledge does not require uh, causation um, and nor does causation require limited knowledge. And so um, that's the point that I've been trying to make with this class, and I hope it uh, it helps. We can come back to this if um, if there's more uh, more needing uh, needed discussion on this very issue. So uh, let me know your thoughts about that. And so one one closing thought. Uh, got a couple of minutes left before uh, the bell rings, so to speak. Uh, why would a loving God, knowing all the pain uh, and suffering? Uh, that that would have to endure, and even his own pain and suffering, why would he even choose to begin? If God is so loving, and he knew this was going to happen, then why even begin in the first place and allow suffering to occur? That's a, that's a huge question. A huge question. And we're going to dive a little bit more deeper into it as we go along, but just, just a few things I want you to consider. Consider this. There was never a time, there was never a time of God's existence that he did not think about you. It wasn't as if God just then decides, hey, uh, I'm going to create man. There was always God, man always was in the mind of God for, throughout all eternity. As long as God existed, you have been in the mind of God. Ephesians 3 verses, verse 11 tells us that this is the eternal purpose of God. Not one that had a beginning or an end, but it is eternal, meaning no beginning and no end. And 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 10 he calls us to eternal glory. If there is an eternal glory that we've been called to, then that call made to us has been eternal in the mind of God as well. What if God ignored your plea? What if in his eternal mind, he saw you? 
and he heard your cry and he heard the suffering that you had and said, well, no, I'm just going to stop. I'm just not going to create man. What would win? What, what would be the result of that? Con consider this, if you will. Should God not have created you? If he looked throughout all eternity and he counted the cost and what was to be given up, if he counted how many troubles in the construction of his church and the issues that they would face in the building of his church and the cost of his, his son, the life of, of deity um, in the flesh, if he saw all the troubles with the labor and all the hatred and all the bigotry and all the, the evil things in this world, and he even saw those who would try to destroy life, and he looked at all that and he said, it's just not worth it. I'm not going to begin. And if God had decided not to, then what would be more powerful than God? I would suggest to you that God would have been defeated. God's love, his infinite, infinite love, infinite hope, compassion and peace would have been defeated before it ever, ever began. And that's not God. God's nature is all love, all compassion, all hope, all peace. And if he were to allow all the, all the suffering in the world to outweigh the blessings that would come from him, what would that declare about God? All of what God is would have been defeated before he ever started. Give that th some thought this week to understand why a loving God created us knowing that there would be suffering and those who would be lost of the world. And then think about why free will was necessary to enter the equation for us to choose freely to love God back and to love his blessings and to have hope in this world and to be reconciled with God. Think of the blessings that come from that. So with that being said, we'll close out our class and thank you for your evening. I hope you had a, a good study and get a good night's rest and continue the rest of the week and knowing you serve an awesome God. Thank you.